Welcome to Earning Freedom, the Straight A Guide Mastermind Program. I'm so excited to introduce you to a mastermind, a guy who's been a great inspiration to me for many years. It's my brother Malik Wade. Malik Wade is going to tell us about his background, about what he's done to prepare for success. And about, so at the end of this video, we're going to hear some really inspirational things about what he is doing to help young people in society make better decisions. But it didn't all begin making good decisions. Malik, tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and give us a little background for on your, in your life. Hey, well, um, I'm born and raised in San Francisco, California, and I'm born in a neighborhood called the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood, which is probably the, the, the biggest black neighborhood in San Francisco. My grandmother lived there and she raised 16 children in that home. But me and my family, we moved. My mother, she moved across town to another area, which is considered the Visitation Valley area. So um, I grew up in public, uh, you know, public housing, subsidized housing. You know, my mother raised three children alone. And I grew up in the 1980s at the uh, peak of the crack cocaine epidemic. And when I turned 15 years old, you know, I sold my first rock of crack cocaine. And obviously at that time, I didn't know that the, I didn't understand the far reaching ramifications that selling that first rock of crack cocaine you know, how it would affect me, my family, and my community ultimately. So, you know, uh, my career didn't last long. I was busted a year later and sent off to a juvenile facility. Um, I got out when I was 17. I continued to sell crack. Um, Hold on, Malik. Let me ask you something. When you got busted that first time and you went into that juvenile facility, tell us a little bit about your mindset. What were you thinking of the first time when you went into the system? Well, quite honestly, when I, you know, I was thinking it was a rites of passage. You know, I was a uh, part of the dysfunctional paradigm in, in the inner cities where when you go to a youth authority or to a youth prison or to a, a juvenile facility, you think that it is sort of, um, it strengthens you, it emboldens you, and it makes your, um, your reputation in the community bigger. So when I went, I sort of embraced it. And I felt like, you know, this is going to be another feather in my cap, another notch in my belt. So when I get out, I'll have um, a reputation of being someone who's, you know, who can, who's not an informant, who's not a snitch, someone who's tough, someone who can fight. And, you know, those are the types of uh, concepts that I identify with at that young age. Yeah, I think a lot of the people listening to our program had that same background and mindset, what differentiates you from so many others is that you eventually got that message, but you didn't get that message until you were much later and you went into the prison system for a long time. Tell us what you did with your life after you were 17 and you came back with that uh, newfound respect as somebody who's, got, who's weathered the system successfully. So I got out of prison pretty much when I was 17. Obviously, I continued to sell drugs. Um, two years later, uh, I had um, I guess what you can consider climbing the corporate ladder in the, uh, in the underworld. And my uh, criminal network had expanded from San Francisco to the East Coast, to Washington, D.C., um, to New York, and to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, eventually, I started to, um, I settled down in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. When I, I went there when I was 19, a couple of years later, the FBI got wind of my activities. They started to investigate me. They indicted me. Um, when they indicted me, I was facing a life sentence. So I fled the country. I fled the United States, and I wound up being a fugitive um, on the FBI's wanted list for the next seven years. So the next seven years, and eventually you get caught, and you get sentenced, and you do some hard time in prison. But your journey through prison is different from most. Tell us a little bit about what you were thinking when you first went inside of the prison system. When I first went inside the prison system, you know, immediately I knew that I had to reshift my paradigm because I knew uh, my first day in prison, I felt I played guilty to 15 years in federal prison at the arraignment because I was facing a life sentence. So at the arraignment, I agreed to take 15 years, which is, you know, it's uh, on one hand, it could be a bitter pill to swallow, but it is, you know, I had no choice. So when I went in, I knew I, I had to change my life because I knew that the next time they would wash me up. You know, I, did, I didn't have an opportunity to get two or three strikes, you know. So when I went in, yeah. I immediately – go ahead. 
No, no, I was going to say that's really impressive. I mean, most guys go in with 15-year sentence, and they're not thinking that right off the bat. I'm, I want to hear more about how it was that you said, I know I don't want to be living in a cell forever. I've got 15 years. It's kind of a break. I'm going to do something with my life. Tell us how you came to that conclusion, and then give us some of the, some of the wisdom of how you were able to reject the, the pressure from other people in prison telling you, you know, how best to serve time. Um, well, I had plenty of examples in my family of individuals who had gone back and forth to prison who had served very lengthy sentences. So when I went in, I knew that I didn't want to be like them. I didn't want to be like my cousin who did 15, 15 years in federal prison and got out and stayed out 90 days and then went back 90, you know, within 90 days and received a life sentence. So I knew when I went in that I had to, I had to do something to educate myself. I quickly learned that the prison would not be responsible for my rehabilitation. I knew that my rehabilitation would come um, solely from within. Obviously, I was able to meet mentors and be able to engage individuals who had information that I didn't have, but I knew for the most part that I would be primarily responsible for my rehabilitation. So immediately from day one, I got involved with um, pretty much every type of education program that I could. Um, obviously, I was, you know, I read a lot. Um, I developed a very strict regimen of studying at a minimum of 10 hours a day, very focused, intense study. I was able to be very crafty in terms of the way I isolated myself from the majority of the prison population, because as we know, prisons, they can be an institution of higher learning in one respect, but they also can be a fertile ground for toxicity. So I figured out a way to navigate the prison um, landmines and it, uh, imp improvise explosive devices. And, you know, sometimes I may lock myself physically in a closet to read for two or three hours at a time. I would find areas where, you know, other guys didn't go. And I would go in those areas and I would isolate myself and I would read and I would study and I would meditate, and I had certain books that, um, that really, really kept me focused. I would always keep a book in my hand as a defense mechanism because, unfortunately, you know, there are a lot of guys in prison that read, but there are a lot of guys who uh, reading is sort of like uh, kryptonite. You know, if you, if you have a book in your hand, it's sort of a defense mechanism because they don't want to engage you because some guys would prefer to stay in the dark. And if they, mm -hmm. see, you, if they see you reading or if they see you, uh, in a quiet room or in an area, you know, educating yourself, you know, for, for hours and hours and weeks and days and months, they would rather not engage you. You know, a lot of people will say that they'd like to change Malik, but you found the, the strength to somehow get away. And as you said, go into a closet and read. Tell us what, how are you able to, to, to push yourself away from those those are different elements inside of the prison that might be wanting to pull you in one direction or another? Well, um, prison obviously is a very unique environment. Um, I believe, you know, you have to carry yourself a certain type of way. You know, you have to, you know, even though prison has uh, a lot of guys who, you know, they have very little understanding. There is, there are, a lot of individuals in prison that do have a certain amount of understanding and respect if they see a guy as being consistent in his walk. If he's consistent in his walk and he owns his walk and they don't see him gang banging on Monday and, 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 and engaging in a certain type of behavior throughout the week and then on the weekend he wants to go to, you know, to the Christian church or if he wants to make salat or, 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 or participate in a religious service, they will, they'll respect that. And, you know, they, they, for the most part, they will, um, they'll respect it. And some guys will even, um, they will encourage you, you know, even though prison is a very macho place, some guys will, you know, uh, they'll let their guards down. They'll encourage you and they'll tell you that they actually are proud of the strides that you take. So it's all about being authentic, being for real, about saying you want to prepare yourself for success. And I know that you were for real because I had the privilege of serving time with you. But, but Malik, tell us a little bit about that, that, that dynamic, about choosing your friends while you're inside. 
you know, you were, what kind of people, tell our audience about the kind of, the ways that you chose associates inside, chose friends inside. What was your process? Um, I was very meticulous in terms of vetting the individuals that I would engage. Um, obviously, I wanted to engage people who I felt had more knowledge than I had. I wanted to engage individuals who didn't go to the hole every other day or every other week. Obviously, I wanted to engage people who wouldn't put me in a situation inadvertently. And I wanted to engage people that had very pertinent and relevant information that could enhance me intellectually, uh, mentally, and spiritually. You know, I, I didn't want to, I couldn't engage guys who were involved in certain type of behaviors because I did not like prison. Prison was very uncomfortable for me. And I wanted to get out of prison eventually one day. And when you choose a set of friends who may be involved in certain type of activities, they could prolong your stay. Mm -hmm. So you, so you chose your friends carefully. You were careful with your, how you managed your days. You said you read as much as studied at 10 hours a day. You tried to isolate yourself from any types of volatility. You were always focused on how you were going to come back successfully. In an environment with 1,000 people, 1,200 people, 1,500 people, how many of our brothers in prison had that same level of maturity or mentality to, to, to adjust the way that you did? Give us an idea of what the culture was like. Well, the prison culture is very, um, obviously, it's very depressing. It's, it's, it's monochromatic and mundane. It's, uh, you know, obviously, it's boring. And it's not very intellectually stimulating. It's, it can be very physically stimulating, you know, because, you know, it's prison. So no matter what level of prison you are, obviously, the higher prison level you go to, the more violence there is. But the lower prison level, the lower the prison level, the more it is an intellectual warfare with the administration. So, um, you know, the environment is an environment that can be very negative and very toxic. However, if you are very meticulous and very, um, very strategic about the people you engage, it could be a very stimulating environment as well in terms of the information that you can extract and glean from certain individuals who happen to be in prison. So it's all about making that full commitment to making decisions in prison that are going to position you for success. They're going to help you learn. And as we've heard from Malik, if you make that commitment, if you go all in, you are going to find opportunities that are available to everybody else on that compound, but not everybody's making the same level of commitment that Malik is describing right now. That's what it means to have the right attitude, to have a 100% commitment to success. And it resulted in Malik getting out as soon as he possibly could. And when he got out, having an extraordinary return to society. And I want to hear a little bit more about how your adjustment in prison, Malik, influenced the end of your prison term and what you were able to do when you came out. One of the most integral things to my, uh, my personal development in prison was something I developed. It's called a personal development playbook. It is a very thick book that I wrote, uh, that I started to work on after being in prison for about three years. After I had been in prison for about three years, with good time, I felt like I would be out probably in about 10 years, nine years. So I started to develop a personal development playbook that was very focused on, you know, first I developed some personal, a personal constitution and bylaws for myself a mission statement for me, specifically to Malik Wade, a vision statement for me. Then I started to develop very specific um, affirmations. Could you tell us about that mission statement right there? Just walk us through that entire uh, playbook? Absolutely. The playbook, would, uh, the playbook was, for example, I would have certain individuals that – when I got out certain individuals that I was going to reach out to, to mentor me for one. And I may, you know, I wasn't getting out for another 10 years, but I would research certain individuals and I would say, when I get out, I want less, I'm I, not, I want, I am going to have less Brown mentor me. I am going to have, uh, I'm going to have um, Tony Dungy, the ex NFL football coach. I'm going to have him, mentored me 
So I would start with things like that and I would speak those things into existence. I would have certain uh, ancestors whose spirits that I would like to invoke. So every morning when I wake up at five o'clock, I would invoke the, I would invoke a Thurgood Marshall. I would invoke a, um, a Johnny Cochran or a Steve Biko. I would have, I developed a, a very specific mission statement that I, you know, learned, you know, by heart. And uh, these are all things that were the ingredients that helped me compile this personal development. I would set goals. This is the type of house I want to live in. The house costs this much. It's in this specific neighborhood. Um, this is how much I'm going to make after being out of prison for three years. My time is worth this much an hour. It may not be worth, worth this much an hour while I'm in prison, but when I get out within three years, my time will be worth this much money per hour. And uh, I started to work on that and I worked on that for the next 10 years. So when I completed that, it you know, the, the, the playbook is about 40 pages. And, um, do you have a copy of it there? It looks like you're looking for it. This, this, yeah, it's right here. <laughs> Show it up, ho hold it up so they can see it in the camera. This is uh, a playbook. It's, it's right on my desk. And this particular page has... Scroll, uh, you can't see it right now, just so you know. Put it right in front of the camera. There you this, go. This particular page in the playbook, all of this stuff was handwritten. A lot of times I would go to the law library in prison and type it up. But these notes are handwritten and these notes here are specific notes from Malcolm X, specific quotes that Malcolm X said that I could identify with. And I go over this every day when I wake up at five o'clock in the morning. And when I get to my office, I skim through it for about 10 or 15 minutes every day. So what's, what's awesome about what you're showing us, Malik, is this whole course, we are teaching this straight-A guide approach, which I know you know about, about living your life by values and setting clear goals and having the right attitude, having an aspiration just like you were describing of what you've done, taking the incremental action steps and knowing that you have a responsibility to hold yourself accountable. And when you're doing that, you become aware of opportunities. You are the embodiment of that. And I know that you've had an enormous level of success, not only through prison, but since you've come home and you're still living by that, which is why I really wanted to share your story because you're a type of guy who doesn't ever ask anybody to do that he didn't do and that he's still doing. That's why you're a leader. That's why I respect, one of the reasons I respect you so much. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm humbled by those comments. Well, it's the real deal, man. You are the real deal. Tell us a little bit about, more about what you've been doing, how your, your really intense preparation through prison, how the decisions you made in prison positioned you for success because you had an extraordinarily successful return to society that very few people can even imagine going to Stanford and finding people. I mean, it's an amazing story, and I'd love for you to tell our audience a little bit more about it. The discipline that I developed while in prison translated to when I to my return when I was in prison I developed the routine of getting up every day at five o'clock in the morning um I still go to the gym every day except I go to the gym every day at six o'clock in the morning seven days a week I still meditate four times a day I eat one meal per day all of those things translated into as soon as I got out of prison within six months I had my, my I had a nonprofit organization established which is is pretty challenging it can usually take up to 18 months for you to get the paperwork filed I got the nonprofit established within six months I was able to develop a board of directors based on people I reached out to um, pretty much while I was in prison I developed a board of directors of some very reputable uh, some very reputable individuals of means who uh, not only are financially uh, beneficial and financially supportive but they're also very uh, stimulating as well in terms of being able to expose me to a different audience of people so I got the nonprofit established um, the nonprofit the name of it is scholastic interest group uh, also known as SIG SIG is a mentoring program for at-risk youth in the community of San Francisco. Primarily, these are student athletes. 
However, I just use athletics as a catalyst, as a vehicle to engage them intellectually. Once I have them engaged, I may be able to give them a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert T. Kiyosaki. I may be able to give them a book by Stephen R. Covey called The, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Or I may be able to give them my book, the autobiography, my favorite book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, once I have them engaged through athletics. The organization itself is not about athletics. For example, every year I take 15 young men on a five college tour to Southern California. Um, this month, uh, March 22nd, in the next about three weeks, I'll be taking some young men from my organization to Ghana uh, on a program called Operation Genesis to you know, look at their origins and their genesis. Actually, there's a total of 16 individuals going. All of those things were um, spoken into existence while I was in prison. All of those things were things that I sat in the hole, in solitary confinement, or in my cell, or in a dorm. All of these things were things that I thought about, spoken to existence, meditated, and prayed, and now they have physically manifested themselves. That is an amazing story. That is an amazing story. I know that you had some, some really influential mentors that came into your life and you participated. In fact, we've spoken together at Stanford. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience at working at Stanford University? Absolutely. Working at Stanford University, I was uh, fortunate enough to um, be recognized by a special program at Stanford University called uh, Project Remade, which is an entrepreneurship program where you, it's specifically designed for people who had uh, been incarcerated. So you go in there and they give you pretty much all of the resources of Stanford Law School, Stanford Business School, and they will give you a mentor. The mentor that they gave me happened to be a very, um, very affluent uh, venture capitalist. And, and a venture capitalist, as you know, is a guy that lets people borrow millions of dollars. He had been a venture capitalist for the last 30 years, so obviously he had a wealth of knowledge in terms of how to generate money. So uh, I was able to engage him. And through my engagement with him, he has been able to introduce me to others, other venture capitalists, hedge fund managers, angel investors, um, other people who are in Silicon Valley, who are in the tech industry. And just one thing led to another. So now I have um, several uh, of those individuals on, on my board of directors. I have a, a, a guy who has a startup tech company on my board of directors. I have a couple of a lawyer on my board of directors and pretty much all of those relationships. They didn't start when I got out. Those relationships started because I, when I sat in prison, I had a very meticulous and strategic plan and I followed those incremental steps when I got out and those incremental steps led me to one mentor who in turn introduced me to other people who could be beneficial to my cause. But you never gave up hope, Malik. You had to go through a de more than a decade in prison, and you always had a focus saying, I'm going to use my time inside not to become, you know, build a prison reputation, but rather I'm going to use my time inside so that when I get out, I can sow the seeds, I can develop and nurture these types of relationships, and people will believe in me, and they'll fund my nonprofit. And that's what you're doing right now. How much resources have you been able to generate to build such an extraordinary nonprofit that's going to take these, all these children to Africa? Well, I know, uh, you know, statistics say that most businesses fail within three. I've been out of prison for five years, and I've had the nonprofit going on five years. And one of the things that makes my nonprofit unique is I haven't raised any money from the government or any city or municipality. I've been able to raise all of my money privately which means I've been able to, to cultivate and nurture personal relationships with individuals who are willing to help me. And it's been four years. And, you know, running a nonprofit to pretty much take care of 15 young men, it ain't cheap. You know, taking young, you know, feeding 15 young men, um, buying apparel for 15 young men, taking them on college tours, um, paying for... Uh, spending money for young men to go to Africa. The Africa trip, although I didn't raise all of the money, I partnered with someone who raised the majority of the money. But the Africa trip is a $120,000 trip for 10 days. 
So, you know, just being able to engage people uh, and get people to, um, you know, being authentic with people and, and getting people to, to buy into me. I've been very transparent since I've been home from prison. I want to be very visible in the community. I like for people in the community to know where I live because I have nothing to hide. I want people to know where I live. I want people to know this is my family. You know, this is my, where my mother lives, where I live, where my wife. I want people to see that. I want people to see me at the church, at the community center, because they can see that he's really serious. He's really, he doesn't have a hidden agenda. He's really doing what he says, you know, he's, do, he's really doing what he said that he was going to do. You are exactly the, the model that, that we try, that I try to share with the Straight A Guide program. You are exactly what I want, to, what I want people to see, listen, and learn from because I know how valuable it would have been for me instead of just coming across by luck. I, I met you inside a prison, you know, but instead of just meeting you inside of a penitentiary, it would have been so much more valuable it, because, I mean, I was lucky. But if I was someplace else, I may not have seen you. If I could have seen you speaking to me, I know I would have identified with you, and I know that I would have wanted to have had that same level of success that you're experiencing. You are a leader of our community, and I'm so grateful that you have taken the time out of your busy schedule to help me spread this message back to the men in the penitentiary. And I'm going to leave these last words for you, Malik. Is there anything that you'd like to share? Because a lot of our members, a lot of our listeners – they're right now locked inside of a segregated housing unit. They're serving sentences with letters instead of numbers. They got life sentences, and it's our job to try and help them see, as people who've gone through it, that the decisions they make right now can have an enormous impact on not only their journey through prison as far as getting them into lower security prisons, but success when they get out. Do you have any, any, any thoughts you might share with our audience? Three things briefly. One is... You have to continue to fight. You know, things change, laws change. When you the, say that you have to continue to fight, clarify that a little bit because you know those words yeah, have a different meaning right, inside there. Right. The connotation that I mean when I say fight, I mean you have to mentally fight because I believe thought is the cause of it all. You have to intellectually fight. You have to mentally and spiritually fight. You can never give up. You have to, you know, I would, you know, there's a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Um, you know, that's a really good book for people to, to read. Um, there is a phenomenon called Stockdale Paradox, where you have to be able to uh, effectively deal with your day-to-day -day existence, but never lose hope in terms of what the future may hold for you. you. Always, if you have a life sentence, if you have 30 years, you always have to be planning, you know, for your eventual, eventual, eventual release. And I'm speaking directly to guys who are in prison right now. If the warden of the prison, if the administration came to your cell and told you today, pack it up, roll it up, you're being released. Would you be ready? Would you be, you have to live like that. You have to live like at any minute you can be released from prison. And that's how I lived. And that's how, that's how I lived when I was in prison. And that's how I uh, dil diligently prepared myself every day. Like I can be released tomorrow. If I am released tomorrow, what type of resources do I have? What type of, what did I do to prepare myself for my release? I really, I prepared myself every day. Like I, I can get out and go to R and D tomorrow. You are the man Malik. You were, you were somebody who did it. It was always an honor for me to call you a friend inside. And I'm grateful that we still have this friendship going five years after you've been out. Yes, sir. One last thing. Um, I have a book that I wrote, and it will be released uh, June, June 5th, 2017, and the book, the title is Pressure, From FBI Fugitive to Freedom, and pretty much it encapsulates and talks about everything that we just mentioned, that we just discussed in the last 30 minutes. Well, I am going to uh, highlight that on the, on the banner of this video. I'm also going to uh, put your name, so anybody who wants to reach out to Malik, the uh, director and founder of Student, re repeat your, your, your organization's uh, name. SIG, which stands for Scholastic Interest Group. And I'm also the CEO of Malik Wave Ventures. Also, uh, you know, basically it's pressure publishing. Malik Wave Ventures doing business as pressure publishing, where I publish books.
a man who did a lot of time in prison but didn't let that hold him down. The decisions he made inside made all the difference in the world, and that's why I was so, uh, so eager to get him on our program today. Thanks so much, Malik, for spending time with us. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Tell One love to everybody. One love.